In today's video, I'll be discussing tips, techniques, and the riding style that I use while out on the trail. Sharing with you the experience I've gained over the past few years, this should help you get the most out of your ride, whether you're on a more expensive build or the cheapest thing you can think of. In this particular video, we'll be riding a $90 Walmart trail bike with a $150 motor. And although some of the information in this video might cross over into your style of riding, please keep in mind that this is geared specifically for two-stroke motorized trail bike riders. Dirt bike, mini bike, dual sport, and street motorized bike riders, this is mostly just going to be for entertainment if that's your style. Warning, an encounter with a wounded animal led to an unfortunate situation. Some of the footage in this video might be distasteful to some viewers. I left it in because this is a situation that trail bike riders need to consider in case they encounter it themselves. This is the poor man's ninja dirt bike. Fits in the back of a standard SUV. I didn't even need to drop the seat, but that does make it easier. So I guess that would make it a great bike to take out like on a long-term trip if you just wanted to do something devoted to bike stuff. Because you got your bike, which is more than capable of handling trails. You've got your spare parts, and then all this extra space for your, whatever you need, including a puppy. A lot of time and effort goes into the making of these videos, so a thumbs up would be much appreciated. And remember, subscribers with notifications, all my videos are ad-free for the first week. Returning viewers who have been following the YD100 build, rest assured this entire trail ride is with the YD100. 
We haven't quite opened her up all the way yet, no high RPMs, because she's just at the end of her break-in, but pretty soon we'll be able to see what she can really do. That being said, I did push it pretty hard in this video, really pulling through some boggy areas. So far, this motor is great. I love it. I hope it holds up. To start this list, I'll say right away that there is no substitute for quality. You get what you pay for, and people with higher-end bikes are going to be able to really boss through some hard terrain. But if you know your line and you've been through a trail multiple times, you can really take these cheap bikes and do things with them that to others might seem unpractical. See, I've been through these trails so many times that I know where I can push the bike and where I can't. I know how to throw my weight around in certain areas. And a lot of getting these bikes to survive these trails, especially the cheap one, is how you throw your weight around. Your center of gravity, your balance, how you go over certain obstacles, it's something that I can't really describe in the video, but rest assured that if you can pull it off and just use common sense, you can get awesome footage like this, or even without a camera, just enjoy the ride by doing things you didn't think the bike was capable of. On all of my trail bikes, the motors have proven themselves quite reliable. In fact, usually the issues that pop up are related to the bike and not the motor, as we've discussed in previous videos. It is possible to get a lemon, a lot of people do, but generally if you make it past the break-in period, your motor's good to go. Usually if there's an issue that's going to cause a catastrophic failure, you're going to find out right away. Reliability is more important than peak performance, so take breaks, run rich, and don't trust know-it-alls. A trail bike rider who shows his plug to the certain Facebook group will have a lot of those users scream at him at how he's running way too rich, but they won't once consider to ask how he's running the bike. These motors are not designed for this. They have a certain speed set in mind, that's why they come with a 44.2 sprocket. Running with a smaller sprocket helps improve cooling even more, but trail bike riders really can't do that. We generally run large sprockets high RPMs, low speeds, where the motor suffers from a lack of adequate air cooling. So running rich is your friend. A richer mixture simply helps cool the motor better. It's not fair to try and compare these motors to things like dirt bikes and dual sports where they can run the sweet spot on the mixture and not have any problems. First, a lot of those are water cooled, and even the ones that aren't are specifically designed to run at low speeds for extended periods of time. These motors are simply not designed to do that. Due to editing and time constraints, you don't see how often I take a break, but I take them quite frequently. I'll probably pull the motor hard for two to three miles, and then pull over and either pedal or get off the bike and enjoy the scenery. Remember guys, this is a trail bike after all, designed to get you places where it's just beautiful and you can enjoy the ride. Now if you absolutely can't be bothered to stop, then pedaling the bike is a the only alternative, really. At least at the end of the day, you can say that you got some exercise, and you made progress. Think of it like this. Pedaling these bikes sucks, yes, but pedaling a stationary bike gets you nowhere. This is kind of an in-between. More drag from the motor simply means a better workout. Now with all that said, there are some things you can do to push a few more miles out of the bike before you have to take a break. For instance, if you're running a standard PK80, Zeta Triple Forty or whatever your flavor of choice is, you can get a larger head. This improves cooling because it has more surface area. Other things I've seen suggested are using a temperature sensor so you can keep an eye on exactly when you should take a break. I haven't looked too deeply into these, but I believe they go underneath or they replace the washer of the spark plug. In my instance, which is not practical for everyone, I got a trail dog. The trail dog has to take a break more often than the motor does. Yes, he can outrun the bike, but only in short sprints. Generally, he'll fall back for the first mile. And when I see him panting, that means it's time for the motor to cool off. Scout your trails. Mentioned briefly earlier in the video, scouting your trails is very important if you want the bike to survive the trip. It's really tempting when you get on a new trail that looks straight and fresh in front of you to just pull the throttle, twist the wrist, and see what happens. Try and resist that urge, because a lot of times, especially where I ride, obstacles are covered by debris. Something might look small, and then you ride up on it, and it hits hard. Bottoms out your suspension and really knocks the frame around. You can get over some obstacles that don't seem practical on cheap bikes. I do it all the time, because I know they're there. I have a bad memory, so personally, the first time I try and boss a trail, I pick the short ones. Only speeding through the big trails that I've been on several times. 
Now, because this seems like common sense, normally I would just leave that subject where it is, but it does go a little bit deeper with that, so stick with me. This is a technique that a lot of professional mountain bikers on YouTube use. They will go through a trail so many times that it becomes boring to them. Or at the very least, it makes them look like a god, and it makes the bike look way more capable than it actually is. I can give you an example. The Huffy Cranbrook that we took on a trail a few videos back hit up a hard section of almost full throttle non-stop for two miles through hard rocky terrain with logs, loose sand, everything you can think of that that bike should not have been able to go through. But it did, because I rode that trail several times before I turned the camera on. Obviously this is not as important if you're just out to enjoy the ride and don't care much about the video, but if you want nice footage, this is something to consider. These bikes are more than capable of getting over or around obstacles as long as you know they're there. Bunny hopping over a log or a hard rock is quite easy to do and almost becomes second nature after you do it a few times. It allows you to put weight where it needs to be at just the right moment and not damage the frame. Keep that in mind. Going with a smaller frame bike is really going to help you get it from point A to point B. A lot of my viewers are stuck in cities with no trails around them. So if you can get a bike to fit in a truck or an SUV or even a van, it's really going to help you out. And the 26 inch frame, it might not sound like a big difference from the 27 and a half I'd been riding in the past, but it is immensely easier to fit this in my SUV than it is my 27 inch. The path dragon I have to lay on its side, but the 26 inch I can stand up and put two bikes next to each other with spare parts and plenty of room for cargo. This will help people get out of the city and find trails. Another big advantage is using Google Maps, specifically the satellite view. A lot of times you can find trails that you didn't know were there. Sometimes they'll be even really close to you. Usually if you're a city guy they're not going to be very big, but it doesn't take much of a trail to get really nice footage and just enjoy a quick fix. Another advantage you're going to find with the smaller frames is generally they run smaller tires. 26 inch provides more torque on the trails than my 27 and a half and definitely a 29 inch, which is just going to complement the larger sprocket even more. Peace of mind and advanced time killing. A good way to kill time that will really help you find some hidden gems is the obvious. Google Maps, specifically the satellite view. Every single trail you see me riding in this video, I found using Google Maps. I would have never known these were here because in my state, to see a trail from the road is pretty much impossible. So Google has gotten really good these days and it's just easy to find these little hidden gems. Taking the weight off your shoulder is also important. A lot of the trails I ride on, I can get to from the house, but if I break down, it's well beyond walking distance. Having someone on standby who can come pick you up is just going to let you enjoy the ride because you won't be thinking about what happens if you break down. I realize that a lot of my viewers don't have a mode of transportation other than the bike that they're riding. So they can't get out onto these trails because maybe they can make it to one, but if they break down they're screwed. Set a date in advance. Pick a day a week or two in advance and then ask a friend or a family member with a vehicle that's capable of carrying your bike if they could be on standby. Tell them that they probably won't have to do anything but just in case you break down could they come get you. And you could sweeten the pot by telling them you'll give them some gas money and buy them lunch. Whatever works for you. I've never actually had to use this but I know if I didn't have my girl on standby that would be the day I'd break down 20 miles away from the house. And this next one I know is kind of a niche, but the buddy system works too. If you have a friend who rides bikes, or if you have two bikes and you could loan one to him, if they have transportation and they can get you to the trails, then if one of you breaks down, at least the other one can go back and get the car. Having more riders does increase the odds that someone is going to break down, but it does improve the experience and will help everybody out. Laziness and forgetfulness. And I'm not talking about laziness from being out of shape. I'm talking about mental laziness. It's important to check your bike before and or after every trail ride. Now if you're like me and you get tired and you've got a bunch of footage you got to deal with, then checking the bike after every trail ride doesn't always happen. Usually, if I have enough energy, I'll spray all the mud off the bike and then spray it down with WD-40 to keep the important bits from rusting. But before each trail ride, you need to make sure that you check everything. Your chain tension, your rear sprocket's still true, your tires are still true, your brakes didn't get all funky, your motor mounts haven't come loose, and your motor's 
is not shifting, etc. There's a lot of things. Forgetfulness. You think you know a lot of things about these bikes and you remember all the stuff you're supposed to do, but believe it or not, it's really easy to forget to do certain things. For instance, I completely forgot to check and maintenance the bucking bar on my clutch assembly, which led to me flattening out the bearing on one of my bikes. That prevented the clutch from disengaging to the motor. I just so happened to watch a video from Epic Bike Shop that reminded me to do that. This is something I knew, I just completely forgot. So giving yourself little refreshers by watching videos in your downtime will remind you to do things to your bike that you already knew and just forgot. And as far as laziness goes, if you're not willing to check your bike before a trail ride, don't go on a trail ride because any little thing that you missed will creep up on you the next day. That's almost a guarantee. On my old Path Dragon, it was usually the rear wheel needed to be retrieved after every one or two rides. Granted, I would push it pretty hard, harder than that bike was designed to go, and those spokes were paper thin, but that was just a thing that was common on that bike. With this bike, hopefully it'll be different. It has thicker spokes, so I'm high hopes. With great skill comes minor sacrifice. Feathering the clutch. This is a skill that's familiar to dirt bike riders and dual sports. It's where you let off the clutch just enough, but you keep the motor in a happy RPM to keep yourself moving ever so slowly. It's useful in loose gravel, sandy areas, boggy areas, anywhere you need to go slow, but keep the motor from lugging. The reason you want to do this specifically on a motorized bike is because when the motor lugs at really low speeds, it hammers the chain. Hammering the chain is not a big deal if you have a 415, but if you have a 410, it puts a lot of unnecessary stress on that chain, including the components it's attached to. It will wear out your puller faster, it'll move your chain tensioner, and it can even loosen your chain by moving the entire wheel closer to the motor. Hammering is bad, so don't go so slow that the bike is jumpy. If you have to feather the clutch, do it. It's fun, and it's a good skill to have in case you plan on upgrading your mode of transportation in the future. Don't worry about your clutch pads. Yes, it will wear them out faster, but they're a lot more durable than people give them credit for, even the cheap ones. The cheap ones will start to burn out faster, and you'll notice that the clutch might slip a little bit under acceleration. But this actually makes feathering the clutch even easier, so I learned to live with it. I've never had a pair of clutch pads, even the cheap ones, wear out so severely from doing this that I had to replace them. But if you do have to replace them, remember that they're cheap, and it only takes about 15 minutes. Another unfortunate sacrifice you might run into if you plan on going off the trail like I do and feather the clutch, which is not directly related to feathering, is your derailleur. It will probably get destroyed. I've nuked two of them, as you guys have seen in past videos, by going off the trail. I got a lot of sticks around here and they get in between the spokes and they just completely destroy the derailleur. You're going at low speed so usually that's the only damage. You might have to re your rim due to a bent spoke but generally going off the trail at low speeds won't destroy anything of great value. You might end up doing what I did and just removing your derailleur completely but I would reserve that to doing only if you need to because it was damaged. Because then you have to tension two chains and that's not fun. Up next is some raw footage, no commentary, no music, just the sweet sound of the motor, pulling through a three mile stretch of my favorite trail. This was the most fun I've had on a motorized bike so far. The YD100 with the 56.2 sprocket and a 26 inch wheel is a fantastic combination and although this might not be the bike this motor stays on for long, this was definitely a lot of fun even with the cheap bike. It pulled through the mud, gravel, and loose sand like it was nothing. Before we get to that trail ride, we're going to cover something that could happen to anyone out on a trail ride. If you're away from cities, it's a higher risk, and if you have a dog, it's even more so. This is not something I considered, because usually if my dog sees something in the woods, he'll run after it for a moment and then run back with a big smile on his face. What I didn't consider is what he might do if he found a wounded animal, which is exactly what happened. He found a wounded hog. Now, hogs can lead to some pretty nasty infections with a bite. Worse if they have tusks. Luckily, this one didn't. The problem is that this animal was wounded severely. Its hind legs were mangled. I'm not quite sure what caused the damage, but I wasn't going to find out. The hog couldn't outrun my dog, and that made my dog very interested. He's young and easily distracted. So unfortunately, we had to dispatch the hog. The video is not graphic or gory, but it is distasteful. Normally, I carry pepper spray with me. Unfortunately, because I was just setting all my gear up and in a hurry to get my dog away from the animal, the only thing I had on me was my pistol. I'm not a hunter. I have nothing against hunting, but I carry my protection. 
mostly for two-legged predators. Out here we have some crazies in the woods and it's just something you need to be prepared for. So if you're squeamish or if you're young, you might want to consider skipping ahead to the timestamp here just for the trail ride. But definitely consider the possibility of running into a wounded animal or what might be worse, an animal with babies. Henry, come on. Come. Come, Henry, come. Come on, Henry. Come here, Henry. Come here, Henry. Come here. Henry, come get a treat. Come get a treat. Come on, come get your treat. Henry, come on. Come here, Henry. Come on. Henry, no. Henry, come here. Come here. Henry, come get your treat. Henry, come on, get a treat. Henry, get a treat. Come on. Henry! Henry, no! No, come here. No! No! That's bad! No! It's gonna have to do. Come on. Come on. I know what that sound was. <laughs> <laughs> 